Hello everybody, welcome back to Small Trees. Uh, today I'm going to do a Q&A video that I promised some people on Reddit that I would make. It's a good day since uh, yesterday it was probably 70 uh, Fahrenheit outside and today it is about 35 so we're not going to be doing uh, much outside. So I'm going to go through some questions, um, answer ones that I've seen. Um, if you have any in the uh, that I don't cover, you can post them in the comments and I will probably address them in a future video. In the background here, um, this was filmed a couple days ago when it was warm. Uh, just making a grow bed that I use um, just to put you know trees in training in and let them grow out pretty quickly. I elected not to kill the grass and instead I am um, just going to place this weed cloth um, and hopefully that will keep the grass from growing up through uh, the soil during the year but I'll have to keep an eye on it. Um, for the wood it is 2x8 uh, pressure treated pine which is rated for ground contact so it should not rot um, you know in a couple of seasons and leave me with a situation where I have to replace it. Alright for the Q&A uh, the first question I got uh, these are all from Reddit was from Beachcomber NC and he said he or she said I need to know about defoliation trimming and how to go about both of these while concentrating on growth of my aerial roots or if I should not do either of them while I'm working on the aerial roots uh, they're speaking specifically about a ficus so um, I guess the first thing we need to do is understand what prompts a ficus to grow aerial roots um, in nature it is you know they, they grow very quickly and they are very um, imposing with these aerial roots in fact I believe that there is a ficus somewhere and I'm not exactly sure the location but it covers it's it's like three acres with the, it has over 3,000 aerial roots so they can become just incredible given time uh, we probably won't achieve that in a pot but we will uh, do our best here to explain how we kind of get to um, encouraging aerial roots to grow. Aerial roots are considered desirable um, because they make the tree resemble like an old banyan tree. Um, however, uh, depending on the school of thought, um, for example in Taiwan, um, the most popular ficus style only uses aerial roots when they enhance the trunk and then they must appear as part of the trunk. Uh, uh, in contrast, I guess we see a lot of trees that have aerial roots uh, protruding from the trunk or um, I would think ideally for us um, coming off of a low-lying branch into the ground. Now for the purposes of this video, I'm going to assume that we are able to, to keep this tree outdoors. Um, it can survive indoors, but it takes a lot greater care. You have to create a microclimate inside and that makes it a lot more difficult uh, to actually get the area roots that you're looking for. Um, so we're going to assume that this tree is outside and um, if not uh, we'll have to make a separate video on that I suppose. So there are a few things that we want to do um, to create the environment or the climate for these aerial roots to grow. Um, you still want to ideally uh, control where they grow, where they uh, come out. You know they still need to be visually appealing. You don't want an aerial root just for the sake of having one. It should contribute to your design. But the first few things that we can look at, um, we're, I'm going to say that we have this tree into a pot that's not in the ground, uh, so we can control the level of moisture in the pot. So there are a few things, a few school, uh, schools of thought here. Um, a lot of people say you want the tree to be root bound. Um, it does not have to be, but the, the reasoning behind that is that uh, if the tree is in a pot and is root bound, then water does not get into that root um, area as much as it should um, because as uh, some of that soil gets pushed out water will either sit on the top or drain straight through without really being able to be absorbed by the tree so that leaves the tree searching for uh, sources of water elsewhere and you know in a ficus obviously that's where we get aerial roots so there are uh, a couple of things that we can look at um, ideally we want to let the tree grow as much as we can um, you asked about trimming. I would not probably be trimming the tree while we're trying to grow these aerial roots because foliage up top is going to stimulate root growth down below and vice versa to an extent. So uh, letting the top grow is going to uh, make it a better situation for the aerial roots to grow. 
Um, the same as far as um, defoliation, I would not do that either. Uh, same reasons, we want growth. Growth stimulates growth, so uh, we do not want to uh, be slowing that down. This will be probably two separate events where we work on getting the aerial roots that you want first, and once they're established, then we look at trimming, then we look at defoliation. Now, if you're in a situation where you do need to repot the tree, um, I would go ahead and do this in early to late spring, like you would normally. Um, cut back your roots like normal. Um, cut back the top, top if you want to. You can just leave it in a pot if it's rebound, that's fine. But if you want to go ahead and repot, go ahead and do it early. Um, fertilize it, let it grow well. And uh, hopefully this ficus will fill the pot with feeder roots by, um, I would say, April or May, um, depending on your location. Uh, once that's happened, once the pot is uh, pretty root bound or it, it's full of roots, we're going to go ahead and, and try to stimulate this aerial root growth. So the way that we do this, uh, probably the easiest way, we want to create a very humid area um, near the base of the tree uh, and that will kind of stimulate the tree to uh, pop out maybe some from the trunk or from a branch that's low lying or something like that. The way we can do this, probably the easiest way would be to take some plastic wrap or a bag or something of that nature and wherever you want the, uh, the roots to come from, you're going to wrap that area with the bag from that area to the ground. And we want to keep that area humid. If you want to put um, you know, a thermometer in there to see what the temperature is, you can. I uh, would not have it in direct sun. Uh, it still could be in the shade because we are trying to get roots at first to grow. That's kind of iffy there. Um, so every day we'll probably open that up and mist if we need to. So the key here is going to be to mist or water the foliage and the trunk, but we don't actually water the pot, uh, the soil in the pot. We want to keep that drier so that the tree will then start searching for water elsewhere and maybe pop out the roots that you're looking for. Um, and then I guess the next step, we're going to fast forward and say that a month down the road, you have the bag uh, around the trunk or you know from a branch to the ground or wherever you want to put it. Uh, and we've got some root growth. Um, but if it comes from the trunk, a lot of times it will tend to grow straight out, uh, which doesn't quite you know, fit the look that you're going for most likely. So you need to angle the roots downward if, it, if they're protruding from the trunk itself. Uh, we need to angle them downward toward the ground. If they're coming from a, a branch, you know, they more than likely are going straight down anyway. But uh, a couple of ways you can do this, you can use just a, a plastic drinking straw, uh, gently place it over the uh, root and let the straw itself weigh the root down. Um, you could use some, we only use something light, something not too heavy because these are going to be fragile while they're white until they um, harden off and turn brown. So you could use some paper, um, an envelope, a card, a small piece of cardboard, something like that. Uh, and we just want to kind of gently angle them towards the ground. Um, another fun fact about ficus roots is they actually contract as they grow, which sounds a little weird, I guess. But what, what, what I mean by that is that as these, uh, for, I'd say, every few inches that they grow downwards, they will also contract back upwards a little bit. So um, the way that that was found out is uh, aerial roots growing down into a pot of soil uh, separate from the pot that the tree was in. And over time, they actually pulled that pot up off of the ground a little bit, which is um, something interesting. And that's actually a way that I guess they anchor themselves. And that's actually allows se several of them to survive um, hurricanes and things like that that toppled many other trees. So in short, to answer your question, uh, Beachcomber NC, um, we do not want to defoliate, we do not want to trim while we are uh, trying to get the aerial roots to grow. To get them to grow, bag around the trunk, mist it, uh, keep it humid. We don't want to keep it absolutely wet, but we want it to be humid. Um, when roots emerge, either place them through a plastic straw or use a cardboard or a piece of paper um, up against the trunk um, to just slightly angle them down toward the ground. Uh, once they have grown, uh, once they're into the ground, you can remove the bag 
and you should be where you're looking to be. Now for anybody watching what's going on in the background, uh, I was going to give you the dimensions of this, um, and this is ballpark. Uh, it does not need to be exact just because this is only a growing bed. Uh, we, in the back, the longest dimension would be the width, and that is 10 feet. Um, the height, I guess, coming towards us would be 8 feet. Each one of these smaller um, pieces of wood would be 2 feet. And then the piece that I'm going to place here is roughly 6 feet. And this allows a pretty accessible area for us to uh, walk around and get into our trees. Um, I'm going to put another smaller uh, box, I guess, in the middle. And we'll just have a pretty separated area where we can put several different trees. We could easily block off each area if we wanted to simulate a, um, a grow box or something like that. So our next question comes from Dan, 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 0123. Uh, it's not exactly a question, it's a statement, but it's, uh, it's a question. It says, proportions of trees, height, width, depth, also minimum heights of trees based on species, probably taking into consideration leaf size after reductions, and how, how far can ramification go? So this is a uh, multiple level question. Uh, and I hate to do this, but a lot of this is going to be in, uh, in generalities because species to species, um, it will vary, but it also depends on what kind of style and it depends on tree to tree what it's going to lend itself to. But we'll get into it uh, and I'll explain you kind of what we're looking for for each just general species you may come into contact with. I'll just hit a few of them. Now, as far as proportions go, uh, we said height width and depth. Depth is going to be very much uh, subjective. In general, you do want a tree, a finished tree, to be um, leaning towards the viewer at its front. Um, and that may be slightly or it may be pretty extreme. Uh, for example, the pomegranate that I had in my last video uh, is very much um, leaning towards the viewer. The, the front actually is over the edge of the pot slightly and that may change because um, Depending on how it grows this year, I'd like to reduce that a little closer to the uh, the earlier bends in the trunk, but we'll see. But my point is, depth is very, very subjective. Um, height and width, not so much. And again, these are going to be general statements because it will vary uh, based on the nabari and based on the movement in the trunk, what you want to do with it. Um, so we'll say trident maples, something that I use, uh, I love dealing with, obviously. Um, the basic ratio for height and width would be um, one inch of width for six inches of height, so one to six. That is a uh, pretty good normal ratio of height to width. Um, we go smaller than that if we go one to four or even one to three, you start approaching a sumo style which um, is very interesting if done well um, if we go um, greater than that so we say one to eight or even one to ten that is something that you may see more often in something like a uh, a regular Japanese maple they tend to be not all of them but they lend themselves well to feminine designs which are generally the more slender um, taller tree pines tend to be taller uh, just in general, there are some showing sized. There are some that are, you know, four to one, six to one. But in general, if you see um, a lot of pine bonsai, they tend to be a little taller and more slender. It really just varies um, based on the tree and to the to the species. I mean, to an extent, but really, it just every tree you have to play with what it's got. So if you have a tree that just has um, stunning nabari and some really nice low down movement, you may want to try to make a shohin that is more, you know, lower than six to one. Um, if you have one that has okay uh, nabari, but maybe it um, looks like it should be a windswept or a, um, a semi-cascade or something like that, then these numbers, you know, they don't really um, come into play as much. It's really just gonna vary based on tree to tree. Uh, and also to an extent, you said probably taking into consideration leaf size after reductions and how far ramification can go. That is true. Um, 
but in general most trees will uh, reduce leaves very well um, to give you a bad example uh, a magnolia has got big leaves and no matter what you do with that it is going to have to be a bigger tree now that ratio uh, is not going to be affected necessarily but if you did want to keep the the traditional one to six then you would need a much much larger trunk for a magnolia than you would for a trident or something that does have generally small leaf size a um, common nursery variant the blood good maple I think a lot of people like them but their nodes tend to be longer their leaves tend to be larger so to have a convincing tree you do need to have a taller tree and again if we want the trunk to be in proportion then we need to uh, we do need to have a bigger trunk as well um, ramif ramification depends on the species when we're talking about um, deciduous trees uh, maples in particular um, you can control that that inner length um, excuse me the, the length in between the nodes uh, very well uh, when you have it into the um, the stage where we have it into a pot and we're trying to work on the ramification uh, in spring you have to keep a really close eye on it. You go in with tweezers and once you have the first uh, buds open up you will pinch those and your next level um, of internodes they'll be shorter whereas if you allow that to uh, elongate then you're going to have a uh, longer space between nodes which makes it more difficult to have the fine ramification that's more important on smaller trees it's obviously very important everywhere but you need a really really small internode length on smaller trees uh, bigger trees a little more forgiving in that aspect what I believe is more important um, than the ratio uh, I don't believe the ratio is paramount what I believe is the most important is that we mimic nature with these trees um, you you have very short trees oaks that have been um, struck by lightning and, and the top has been blown off or something like that uh, we have very tall trees um, pines on mountains that are very twisted and scarred because of their environment and you really those trees don't have a specific ratio or anything like that uh, what we need it to be when we look at it is believable that this tree could be a full grown tree in a field or on a mountain or on a river bank or something like that so I think that is more important to keep in mind whenever you're trying to style a tree you want the trunk line and the branches to tell a story about the tree's life um, if the branches uh, don't match the trunk line then you have an issue if the trunk line is uh, very curvy and fluid uh, the branches should match that to an extent if you have a formal upright if you have a pine that is uh, straight up the branches should to a degree um, mimic that they should not have a lot of back and forth crazy movement because um, that's not convincing whatever happened to the trunk also happened to the branches while the tree was growing so they should mimic each other now I know that's not the most specific answer and that may not be what you were hoping to hear uh, but if you can uh, give me any specific species you'd like me to speak about I'd be happy to do that but um, just in general the, the real answer is it varies it varies tree to tree um, a little species to species depending on um, how big the leaves are and how close the nodes are together in general uh, but overall it really just you have to take each tree um, one at a time and decide what you're going to do with that tree now the next question comes from and I'm sorry if I mispronounce this D Cabins um, D Cabins I'm not sure uh, but they say I've seen people plant a tree in training on top of a tile or even nail a square of metal to the root base to force the roots to grow horizontally. I haven't tried anything like that yet and would love to see more examples of the technique. Also, reducing large Yamadori, I dug up this large Ilex and it's just now starting to grow again. I'm afraid I'll kill it once the time comes to cut the root base back further. I'd like to see more examples of large Yamadori being trained and reduced in size. Um, so two questions here. Um, I will address the latter one in a minute. Um, but I'm going to get the first part first and luckily for you or luckily for me I guess um, I have a pretty good bit ex of experience in this and I'd be happy to explain to you why we do it how it works and just give you the ropes so first off while we do it um, we plant a tree through a tile 
or through a piece of metal or through a block of wood uh, as a seedling and we put it into the ground and the idea is the same as girdling a branch or something like that as this tree grows through this whatever we have and it, it grows in size um, that tile or piece of wood or metal will start to girdle uh, the tree itself and as that happens um, the tree above as the foliage takes um, nutrients and tries to send them down to the roots um, over time the the uh, diameter will increase and it will start to swell or bulge at the base of that block and when it does that eventually there's going to be a choke point there you're going to get some callusing and it's going to throw roots on the top of that tile or block or piece of metal and you're gonna get basically a head start on a radial root base uh, it's not always going to be um, cookie cutter sometimes you'll get roots on one side of the trunk and not on the other and they'll be uneven um, but at the very least these roots should all be on the same plane which kind of gives you a little head start when you're trying to build a good base for a tree if you're looking for um, more naturalistic style uh, you would probably let these roots go ahead and form uh, before you cut the bottom off before you separate the original roots from the top um, however if you want a more even nibari and when I say that I mean no overly heavy roots it's actually advisable or it's been advised to me to um, go ahead and chop the bottom off when you see the callusing above uh, the block or the tile and whenever you get that the callus itself should um, start forming roots and it will grow um, very radially and you'll end up with a very radial uh, I hesitate to say pancake nabari but uh, something along those lines where it is very much um, no single strong roots it's just all even now I've actually um, doing an experiment this year and we will um, test that exact theory and I'll, I'll make a video on it but I've planted about I don't know about 50 seedlings through instead of a metal tile or uh, a piece of wood I've actually planted them through a small washer and we're going to test that theory and as soon as that washer starts girdling the tree and we start getting a fair amount of callusing I'm going to remove the bottom off of these plant them back in the ground and let them grow for the season and we will see uh, just how well uh, that technique works so you'll have plenty more examples of this technique in the coming months um, if these grow quickly like they should um, I'll probably have them separated by I would say mid-April and then we'll have the whole growing season uh, to put them in the ground and really let them run free uh, I guess a side note, a little more information about this. Uh, if we do what we're talking about, we cut the bottom off and we just throw it into the ground, whatever roots form are still going to want to grow straight down. So no matter what you do, you should probably place um, a pot or a another tile or something under this tree uh, and fasten the tree to that in some form or another so that the roots are forced to grow um, on a flat plane. Otherwise, you will just be uh, ruining what you've already done because the roots that form will just go straight down instead of straight out. You'll want to fasten um, the tree to whatever you're using underneath it as well because if you don't uh, adhere the tree pretty well to it, uh, it will the roots that form will actually push the tree up away from that tile or whatever and then they'll still try to force themselves to grow downward. Um, if these are bigger trees, um, more than pencil thick, it's advisable to take a board uh, and maybe screw straight through the board into the base of the tree and that way the, the tree is firmly adhered to that um, board or tile. If you do that with too small of a tree though you will split the trunk and in some cases that can actually help uh, make taper uh, but you still risk, run the risk of uh, killing the tree if it's too small and you run a screw uh, through the base of it so that's the only drawback that I see to doing this uh, washer method is that I'm not sure how I'm going to uh, attach these to any any form of flat whatever uh, once I separate the bottom roots now on to the second part of the question reducing large Yamadori um, more examples of large Yamadori being trained and reduced in size I'm gonna couple that with the next question um, from deep blue free dive and they said how to it says execute proper Yamadori on junipers and what I believe they mean is how to 
uh, harvest these trees from the wild or if you're like me uh, the wild would consist of people's uh, yards when they were doing landscaping I wanted to get rid of the trees but we'll go through both of those really quickly collecting junipers is a little bit different than collecting a deciduous tree you have to be a little more careful uh, deciduous trees can take more root cutting uh, more cutting off the top a lot of times you can you know chop up a maple or a, um, an oak or something uh, when you collect it and it'll be fine it'll bounce right back uh, with a juniper if we're collecting it from a yard or if we're collecting it from the mountains um, you want to take a lot of care with the root ball uh, you want to get as much of it as you can um, you can reduce the foliage a little bit but I would not do very much um, you need to keep it in proportion with the root ball you need to make sure that you uh, wrap that root ball in damp cloth or moss or something like that immediately if you cannot um, get it to a pot right then like if you are in the mountains or something if you're not if you're in someone's yard uh, the point is you need to get it immediately into some soil as quickly as you can and keep the roots wet um, the soil you need to use is going to be something that drains very well we don't want a, um, a very wet soggy mix for a juniper um, you want to make sure that you anchor this tree so that it is completely stable. It's very fragile when it's first been collected and you need to make sure that the wind or you moving this box getting into a spot in the garden is not going to injure any roots that may be fragile that may be forming. Um, so we want to wire it in from the bottom if we can uh, but you may have to get creative if you're using a wooden box but the, the main thing is that you do immobilize the tree. Um, you want to make the pot to fit the root ball. You do not want to cut the root ball to fit into the pot. Uh, that is going to probably cause the tree to die. So we want a, a pot that is um, big enough for the root ball but not overly big. If it is too big then you tend to get overly soggy soil and you may get root rot which is not what we want. We want a well draining environment for the new roots to grow and um, make the tree a little more healthy. Going back to the question about the ilex or holly, um, we said it was a large tree and you've dug it. Uh, I'm guessing we've potted it and you want to know how to uh, work it when it comes time. So my first thing to tell you is you have traumatized the tree by digging it and, and collecting it. So you want to give this tree time uh, to recover. And that may be a couple of years. Holly uh, grow fairly quickly, but they still are going to need, I would say, at least one or two years before you think about reducing the root mass. Um, and when you do reduce the root mass, we're going to be looking at roughly 25% at a time. And the way that that looks is um, you can either go straight off of the bottom if you need to, or you can go and reduce, uh, remove roots and wedges um, and replace that wedge with uh, better soil each time. Uh, you would just kind of work it like you would a pie around the tree, but no more than 25 or 30 percent of the root, uh, root mass at one time. Of course, some of this is going to depend on how aggressive you were when you first collected the tree. I have no way of knowing you know, what the root ball looks like right now. Hopefully um, it's in pretty good shape. But if it's not, uh, you need probably need to give it extra time to recover. You should be able to tell um, probably the first year you won't see much uh, foliar growth. But the following year or the year after, it should really accelerate if the roots are uh, growing like they're supposed to and if they're healthy. So if the top uh, starts growing a lot, uh, maybe next year, that would be a good sign that the roots are probably in a better place to be worked. Um, the same would go with the juniper. Uh, if it is... Uh, slow growing up top or you see browning that's not a good sign you want to make sure the tree is in absolute uh, peak health before you try to injure it by working the roots especially in trees like that that are a little more temperamental um, versus a deciduous tree so that's it for my first Q&A if there's more interest I'd be happy to do another in the future if you have more questions for me post them down in the comments I really do appreciate and enjoy reading the comments if you enjoy what I'm posting, if you could subscribe to, I would really appreciate it. Uh, until next time, you guys have a good day.